Okay, hi everybody. I'm Anne Stobart, um, medical herbalist, and it's an honour really to, to be able to talk to such a large group in person and potentially through the recording. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Holt Wood, which, which was a land project. I'm, I'm retired, retired now, <clears throat> doing other things. And so um, I'm going to, the first half of the talk, I'm going to talk briefly about the background and why we wanted the project uh, in herbal medicine, really, and about the actual transformation from a redundant conifer plantation. And then the second half, I'm going to talk more specifically about some trees and outcomes. So I'm going to share my screen. I just need to check that this is going to work so that you can, I've got about 35 slides. Can I have a, yes, I see them. Great. Thank you. So uh, I need a clicker. <laughs> so oh, this is um, the lower part of um, Holtwood. Holtwood is on a slope in, in North Devon. And so we're very fortunate to have lots of different environments. But um, so th this is what the talk will focus on. And um, amongst the medicinal trees that I'm going to talk about, which is a bit of a thing for me, I'll talk a bit about antivirals because that's a very topical issue. So um, as a result of the project, which ran from 2004 to 2020, um, last year, I was able to publish a book. Unfortunately, um, lockdown stopped me getting out and about to publicize it, but it's um, from permanent publications. So I will refer to that a couple of times in the talk. My background is in education and in my 30s, I trained in professional herbal medicine as a practitioner, seeing patients, taking full case histories, using differential diagnosis to identify problems and then putting together treatment plans, including lifestyle, diet and herbal um, prescriptions. So from there, I moved on to training other medical herbalists at uh, the University of um, Middlesex, Middlesex University in London, um, but I took retirement, uh, early retirement in 2010 and um, carried on with my practice in, in Devon. So uh, if anybody's interested in finding out about local professional herbalists, I insured ethical guidelines and so on, there are online registers for a number of organizations like the National Institute of Medical Herbalists and the College of Phytotherapy Practitioners. The other important point about my background really is the availability of herbal medicines as supplies. You probably won't be surprised that most herbs that you buy over the counter, whether extracts or whole herbs, are wildcrafted and um, surprisingly, in many cases, imported. And that's what got me started really when I realized that hawthorn berries were being imported from Eastern Europe when in fact you, <laughs> you can't move in this country without coming across a hawthorn hedge. So here's a slide which is just a little bit about the fact that um, many species are vulnerable. Um, in actual fact the primary reason for that is because of habitat change, because of agriculture taking out wild locations. But so one of my um, if you like my rationale for setting up um, our project, amongst other reasons, um, keen to practice permaculture design principles, was to look at providing supplies for my practice as a, as a herbal, um, clinical herbal practitioner. So we found a site, two and a half acre site in um, North Devon, and this is what it looked like here. This is the um, conifer plantation. It was Sitka spruce, mostly about 30 or 40 years old, two and a half acres. And uh, this was the site um, within five or six years, um, full of upcoming young woodland. And this bottom right is the back of a envelope plan, which I drew up in the early days. Um, we, we weren't able to uh, do anything with the site along by the road, this area, because that was retained by the previous owners, Woodlands for Sale. 
um, but we were able to um, clear the whole of this two and a half acre site and replant in, in sections. So the site was based in, in North Devon and uh, I'm actually more near to Exeter. So um, of course, this is an oceanic climate, lots of rain, um, quite acid soils in typically, and, um, but, but nevertheless, um, quite mild. And this was what the site looked like from the river side. We didn't actually have part of the river, but we were neighboring a meadow that neighbored the river. And these are Sitka spruce. They were in very good condition. Somebody had looked after them. I think it was a, an insurance company that bought them. And um, we tried initially to cut down a few trees. Sometimes I'm asked by people, how do you um, put medicinal plants into an existing woodland? And if, <laughs> if you want to put plants into an existing woodland of this kind of size, you have to do more than cutting down a few trees. To, to make uh, sufficient light um, available. And um, we were fortunate to find someone who did take the trees for chip and planking and, and gave us about a pound a tree, which was um, about a thousand trees. So that gave us um, a starting budget. And we also got the same amount from Forestry Commission for a management plan, which I put together replanting mixed broadleaf woodland and this is what happened to them so we were lucky to find a local contractor who knew what he was doing with trees mm. and and he was fairly light on the site although when you see this you realize that tree felling or clear felling <laughs> is not ideal um, you can just about see these rows of stumps we left them in we weren't going to try and get them out. And the contractor was sympathetic. He, he put in lots of small bonfires to clear um, all the spoil rather than one huge bonfire. Below, you can see the river is behind these trees in a neighboring meadow, which we didn't own. So <laughs> we uh, started out with about 2000 pounds and we did have to add some more money to put in a deer fence. We, we realized that if we were gonna replant something of the order of a thousand, maybe more trees, that um, doing individual tree guards was gonna to be tough going. Um, and um, so the back of an envelope plan, we had a sloping downhill area at the bottom. And in that area, we we're gonna put willow and alder, Danny Birch, and add in medicinals like Buckthorn and Gelder Rose or Cramp Bark. And then we had a steep slope, very stony area. And the top part of the site, sections A to F, was very poor, claggy soil. And that area was going to be replanted with hazel oak backbone um, plus um, ash. And, and then each section was going to be surrounded by more medicinal trees, including introduced non-native species such as ginkgo and North American species. I will say a bit more about some of those um, shortly. So in the first couple of years, our trees were planted along ridges because of the wetness of the area. It seemed to make sense to use those and at a two meter spacing and the ridges themselves were two meters apart. And at the back of this photograph, you can just about see our fencing, two meter high deer fencing, and also what started to happen to a neighboring, the neighboring plantation once ours was taken down. And you can see how incredibly um, shallow this root plate is here of these Sitka spruce. They just started going over one by one, which actually was quite a good thing because it revealed clay pits, which we found could be fired uh, quite successfully once the clay was sieved of stones. And this is the site considerably later on, looking from above, this is the area near to the main gate. And you can still see the ridges and furrows running 
diagonally across the, <clears throat> uh, the picture. But also you can see our addition. So for example, um, a log um, stand, compost bins, and um, uh, a compost toilet, flower beds, and uh, over here, what started as a mushroom house became a propagating, uh, a marvelous shady propagating area, simply a timber frame covered with mesh. Um, we got a, a pond established, and this area here is a miniaturized version of the whole project, which started out to supply me as a herbal practitioner, but very rapidly became a, a demonstration project. And so we wanted to have um, a selection of the trees and shrubs that we were growing near to our main gate, where we would sit people down when they came to visit. So we learned quite a lot as we went along. I'd done a little bit of permaculture training and um, this uh, slide shows one of the rides, the wide rides. In fact, it was uh, one, two, three, four, it was five uh, ridges wide. So it was 10 meters wide. And I think it's probably about after eight, 10 years, you can see that growth was substantial and trees were attempting to close over the ride. So whenever I talk to people about doing this, I always point out that getting the trees spaced out is quite important. And down at the bottom of this area, uh, some trees were growing even faster. And this is a willow, um, possibly a cricket bat willow. We were asked for white willows, but sourcing correct species is not always easy. Um, and it had grown to, well, well over 35 feet in the space of 10 years, um, possibly topping 40 feet. So, um, so we had about 1200 trees planted in total. And we also set up flower and herb beds near to our main sort of zone one area where all the activity um, was going on. And in the, the this is um, echinacea, purple coneflower stimulates the immune system, uh, plenty of marigolds and also some rudbeckia, uh, very useful resinous um, plant for making balms. Uh, here we've got um, marshmallow, which the roots are quite useful for making a uh, soothing syrup for coughs and the like. And there's this a whole, whole lot, bunch of other things. <laughs> so the, the main thing that I was interested in was learning about coppicing and pollarding for, of medicinal trees. And here's a, a, I don't know what's happened to my slide here, but um, this is a, a violet willow. We can tell it's a violet willow because it's got these dark colored stems, which in fact are richer in active ingredients than white willow. And um, so we, we also had uh, quite a lot of fruit and nut trees, which are shown along this ride. Um, apple, pear, plum, um, smaller things, black, black currants, raspberries and the like. And you can see that we had quite a lot of strimming to do to maintain the access. So one of the things we didn't really plan for at the beginning was how to ensure ground cover uh, with shrubs. We started to, to work on that in the later days. We also found a lot of material on site, for example, stone to produce uh, a better access track on the top. And um, we were able to use uh, wood in lots of ways. So this was a stream or a rather a, a gully that ran along the site side of the site. So we were able to create um, water movement, divert, divert water around the site. It was a very exciting project to be involved with. Um, lots of wonderful biodiversity. And as you can imagine, um, productivity was high. I think if you, anybody involved in forest gardening is surprised and shocked at the productivity. And this was harvesting early, early on, quite early on, after five or six years, I think. Um, this is uh, cramp bark, excellent antispasmodic bark. So this is just uh, harvested as the leaves are beginning to sprout, which makes for good, easy peeling of the bark. Uh, what else have we got? Ash, ash bark. Ash makes a wonderful anti-inflammatory. 
and uh, buckthorn, which is a, a, a wonderful native plant. There are two kinds of native buckthorn in this country, in the UK. Um, very good for biodiversity and a very powerful laxative. It has to be aged the bark before it can be used. Um, cherry, this is um, bird cherry and the bark has good antispasmodic effect due to alkaloid content, which is so effective in suppressing a cough, it's used as a, a cough syrup. So these were all supplies that I could use. It was so productive that um, I had to start thinking about other ways of, of using the produce. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. But this is the Google uh, shot, so you can see the uh, Sitka spruce is all gone and the sections more or less evident there. And we started running day courses in design of the medicinal forest garden and um, harvesting. So we got people in and we got them to um, peel the bark and, and use bark to make um, powder capsules, um, distillation, making all sorts of things. So you might ask, well, what else did we make? Here's a picture that went, I think it went into the book and just going for sort of left, left to right, distilled rosemary here. This is a cough syrup, capsules of probably cramp bark. Um, betula is birch, so birch leaf, um, laxative bark and willow leaves. So not just the bark, but the leaves could be used from lots of things. And we created our own line, Holtwood Herbs Body Care. Some of the items were things that I'd made previously as, as gifts or for patients, but some of the items were new, in particular, witch hazel, which is a North American plant, which um, we started to distill. Uh, it's a, a, a very um, worldwide um, skincare product. And um, this little chest, I used to do quite a few talks around the medicinal herbs and the chest is full of myrtle um, twigs left over from making something, drying the leaves, I think. Uh, it turns out myrtle twigs are really good as toothpicks. <laughs> They're slightly antiseptic. Oh, and uh, here we go, soap. Uh, we put some of our dried willow bark into soap as an exfoliant, as well as some other goodies. And this is a witch hazel, I think it's a deodorant. So witch hazel distilled and rosemary distilled make wonderful deodorant. So we, we got into the, the sort of body can, we sold online. Um, we didn't have a shop or anything, we just sold online and we did lots of talks. So although the herbs were used in my clinic, we were also able to get income from online sales of produce and uh, the day courses and there's more in the book actually about um, recipes and some of the issues around selling um, direct to the public because you can't do make you can't make medicinal claims um, although medical herbalists do have um, uh, can prescribe and diagnose direct to patients. I want to talk about I can answer questions at the end about this, but I want to talk a bit more about some specific trees. And in particular, I mentioned hawthorn at the beginning. Um, hawthorn is very well researched. It's particularly um, proven in clinical trials, not just laboratory and sort of in vitro or uh, in the test tube type um, studies. Hawthorn is well researched to um, promote heart action and to moderate blood pressure. So if blood pressure is too high or too low, it can help um, to the extent that herbal practitioners will not normally give it uh, alongside orthodox uh, prescriptions for blood pressure problems or heart problems because um, Hawthorne is so effective, it can um, make uh, the overall um, effect too strong. So I have included a few references uh, for these points, but there are more references in the book. And also I've, I've done a, a sheet on the talk, which Kath's got. So if you want that, you can ask for it. Um, you can make your own Hawthorne brandy. 
I'm just uh, very delicious. You just need cheap, cheap. Actually, I think this is Hawthorn gin. Cheap, cheap, 40% alcohol. Grab some Hawthorn berries, just pick them over so any dirty, diseased or bad ones are out. Um, bash them a bit in a plastic bag with a hammer and put them into your spirit. Let them stand good, give them a shake every four to six weeks, every week for four to six weeks, and they'll be ready in time. It'll be ready in time for Christmas. And um, yeah, a teaspoon to a tablespoon a day wouldn't go amiss in um, promoting your circulation. I also mentioned buckthorn. Buckthorn is a um, laxative. This is the bark uh, dried. This is the tiny flower of buckthorn. You get them all through the summer, the late spring and summer. They're fantastic. It's, it's continuously buzzing, the buckthorn. We have one in our cottage garden. But it's, it contains anthraquinones, which as they go through the gut, they become quite stimulating. So they stimulate a constipated colon. Um, not ideal for a colon that's in spasm already. So that's where if you have a, um, a chronic complaint, it's a good idea to see a medical herbalist before taking some of these herbs. Elder, well, um, wonderful plant. It can be coppiced, pollarded. The flowers make a good culinary addition as well as can be dried for a tea. And the berries make a fantastic Ribena-like syrup, all great for colds and flu. And um, if you coppice, then you should be getting fruit by the third year because it flowers and fruits on the one-year-old wood. So it's quite a, a useful plant in that respect. I mentioned witch hazel. Uh, this is a little witch hazel here. This is not the garden centre witch hazel, which you might find yourself paying 20 or 30 pounds for. But the Golden Centre Witch Hazel is an Asiatic one which flowers in the early New Year. This is American Virginian Witch Hazel, which flowers in the autumn and is quite often used as the stock plant on which the Chinese or Japanese hazel is grafted. So we obtained the original stock plants from a nursery in Kent. And um, we, I think we planted four dozen and um, I think about two thirds of them survive. They like a woodland edge. And I was, harv this is harvesting in uh, spring, late spring, harvesting the leafy twigs, which you can see in the basket, and they can be distilled to make a, a very useful astringent um, water toning for skin and the like. Most witch hazel distilled comes from North America. So we're providing a, an alternative perhaps without the shipping costs. Cramp bark is another really useful medicinal. It's also known as a gelder rose or snowball tree, and it's incredibly bitter. The berries are so bitter, they're not even taken by birds unless they're desperate. But it's the bark that we're after. Coppicing produces these lovely long stems, and they can be easily, this is second year on coppice, they can be easily um, stripped with a slightly curved knife, something like a carving knife works well. And um, then that can be dried and ground and put into capsules. Fantastic for contractions of any kind, really. Period pains, frozen shoulder, all those types of problems. And I mentioned willow, uh, the violet willow. This is uh, what the powder looks like when it's been dried. Um, the bark has been dried and ground and the violet willow we preferred because it's less um, strong growing than the white willow. And the active ingredient salicin or salicylic acid is um, tends to be present in darker coloured willows more strongly. So uh, purple willow would, would also be an alternative um, to, to harvest. And lots of uses for that. And of course, you can take the leaves as well. What I found was that willow pollards and coppices so strongly that I was able to thin out branches later in the year. So I was able to get quite a continuous harvest. So not all of our trees are native. And um, this is Forsythia suspensa, which is quite hard to obtain because it's a very lax growing 
forsythia. So it's not the typical forsythia cross intermedia, which is available in garden centers. And it doesn't really fruit, doesn't produce its um, fruits in the UK. It's an Asian plant, but the flowers are very useful. And you can use the ornamental flowers as well as the, the original species. Uh, they can be taken, it's an anti-inflammatory and uh, perhaps a bit like elder really can be used um, in colds and flu and it can also be used as an astringent on the skin. So there are many, many ornamental plants which have medicinal uses and many of them arrived in this country originally as medicinals and then became sort of adopted by gardeners in more showy forms. And um, prickly ash, another uh, plant which is found in both in Asia and North America. This is the North American kind, but many of you be familiar with the Asian um, Szechuan pepper and the like. Uh, it does well in a more calcium rich place. Ours tended to stay quite small, very, very thorny. So watch out. And these are the unripe berries and all parts of the plant are powerfully stimulant. So it can be used as a sort of temperate alternative to ginger. You can drop a few berries in tea to spice it up um, because of its antiseptic and antifungal effects. It's um, extremely useful. Um, we started to manage ours a bit like gooseberry bushes, but I think in more calcium rich soil, you can uh, grow a larger small tree version. How am I doing? This is my last tree, so I'm just going to keep chuntering on. I hope we have enough time for everything. <laughs> okay, and of course, ginkgo. You can't um, go without mentioning ginkgo. M many people um, have got ginkgo growing around them in streets, in towns, and I don't know if they realise how useful it can be. It's a, the leaves are very anti-inflammatory, and they're usually harvested much later than other leaves, almost when they're starting to yellow. Uh, not completely yellow, but that's when they're richest in flavonoids, which are the active ingredients. And, and this is a very um, tolerant plant for lots of different situations. It will grow very, very big if, um, if you give it the chance, but um, uh, it pollards and coppices is quite well. In fact, um, most commercial ginkgo is produced from coppice plantations some in Europe, but uh, also in, in China. So I kind of zoomed through and I'm going, literally, uh, I'm going to uh, just talk about a particular kind of herbal, uh, set of herbal actions, because um, the way that herbalists trained is to develop their knowledge, detailed knowledge of herbal actions and the plants that carry those out. And very often you'll find plants in the same family or closely related species will give you similar actions. So for example, here we have snow gum. Snow gum is tolerant of lower temperatures and so more of a mountain gum, um, eucalyptus. Um, so I experimented with that to see if it would grow well um, in our situation but other eucalyptus species may also be productive. And of course, eucalyptus produces lots and lots of essential oils, which are highly antiseptic. So when I say woody antivirals, what I'm thinking of is plants that can be used in a situation, a viral situation. Well, um, the resins and essential oils are really useful for preventing further bacterial um, attack, and also for opening up the airways through um, uh, infusions that um, uh, steam and so you can inhale them. I've mentioned already, oh, sorry, <laughs> going backwards here. I've mentioned already um, forsythia as an anti-inflammatory, great for after effects of cold and flu. And um, it's, it's relative elder, uh, sorry, similar um, plant elder, they're not related, um, is, has been shown to reduce the symptoms in, I think it was a study of air travelers um, and reduce their um, effects of um, jet lag and colds and flu. 
prickly ash I've mentioned and um, how it's a good circulatory stimulant. So that's a nice warming herb. Black currant, you might be aware that apart from the berries, that black currant leaves are also um, very useful, full of polyphenolic content, which is beneficial in uh, fighting off infection. Douglas fir, which is a North American um, pine conifer, is uh, again full of essential oils, as is myrtle, which will grow in a nicely sheltered situation, and sweet gum. I've mentioned witch hazel, I mentioned ash. Oh yes, Siberian ginseng um, is an adaptogen. By an apt adaptogen, we mean herbalists mean a plant that is useful in helping the body to fight stress and so helps to, um, if you like, uh, protect the body both before getting an infection, so stopping the immune system from dropping out and also helps in, in recovery. There are a couple of these which are specifically antiviral and uh, so um, antivirals vary in their action. Some are will stop the spike protein from attaching, some will stop replication. I, I have to say, health warning, there is no particular herb, there is no magic bullet for um, viral complaints, but um, all of these will help to um, not only protect you, but also help you to recover. And personally, I go with orthodox medicine, so I would say have the best of both worlds. So vaccines and herbs is my view. Next, outcomes. So I'm coming to the end here. Um, we've got about five more slides. For us, Holtwood was fantastically biodiverse. Uh, I haven't mentioned lots of aspects of it. It was incredibly sustainable. The production level was high. We improved the soil dramatically through uh, strimming and mulching and, and all of those things. And we were able to uh, see very positive outcomes, both in productiveness, both for my, my own clinic, but also for other people in terms of body care and so on. But we were able to share a lot of our learning through our courses and now we've gone online and of course producing the book. And here are some of the challenges that I think I feel we've started, not necessarily finished with. One is what do we mean by medicinal forest garden? Another, which was an ongoing issue, is how to market, how to make sure that what we produced found a market. Um, the best ways to pass on our learning and our advice. I can't tell you how many times people contacted us and said, can we come and visit? And it, ultimately we had to do something about that because we we couldn't afford the time and loss of income. Um, there's definitely challenges in sourcing plants of the right species. And perhaps the one thing that I have managed to do is develop online courses as an alternative because we, we had to stop offering the courses during the pandemic and, and then I retired and we, we sold uh, Holtwood. So the other thing I did manage to do was define a medicinal forest garden. This is my definition, which I put in the book. Um, um, a natural or designed space, multi-layers, ethical and sustainable, promoting health. And um, what I realize now after a few talks is that actually a medicinal forest garden is not a thing, but a concept. And when I say that, what I mean is you can have medicines in lots of different situations. This is our cottage garden and it's full. These are all medicinal trees growing here and lots of herbs here. This is um, organic tradings uh, field where they grow some fresh herbs. And this was Trill Farms uh, tea herbs. And this was the botanic garden at um, Middlesex University. So all of these different uh, settings have, if you like, medicinal forest garden constituents. But um, I think what I want to emphasize is that you don't have to be uh, focused solely on medicinals. And I'm sure uh, already people introduce themselves here and many of them mention medicinal plants. 
So just finally to mention the, the main outcome really after um, 15 or so years was setting up a website for the Medicinal Forest Garden Trust. And um, do have a look. We've put on there, uh, I'm writing about one or two blogs a month to add, um, there's links there to the online courses which replace the physical courses. And there's a, a little shop if, if you want to buy a, a signed copy of the book, just let me know and I can um, uh, get it out to you. So we basically um, have a lot more to learn, but it seems to me that my starting point, which was that we should be able to grow more of our own medicinal supplies, um, particularly trees, was something that I was able to achieve. And, um, and so now in my so-called retirement, I'm spending a lot of time um, working on the blog and the website, uh, running the online courses and generally doing talks and writing for other places. So I'm hoping that this message will get out there that um, it's possible not only to get um, herbs going for self-sufficiency, but there also, I think, is more commercial potential in the longer run. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And just show you a few of the things that I've got here. This is um, uh, mullein. It makes a very, the flowers make a wonderful ear oil. It's quite a little bit antiseptic and very softening for people who suffer from earwax. I mentioned distilled rosemary. This is the most fantastic thing. If you put, oops, you put it in a, a small bottle in, in a car, if you have to drive anywhere, it stops you from falling asleep, um, but can also be used as a hair rinse, make your hair grow, etc., etc. et cetera. Et cetera. Um, ivy and thyme cough syrup, very nice for soothing troubled bronchi. And I mentioned right at the beginning, I don't know if everybody, oh, here we are. These are um, capsules of, this is white willow capsules. Um, white willow is incredibly bitter, so you really have to take it as capsule if you're using it as a painkiller. And this is uh, hawthorn, it's hawthorn brandy, but you can make it with gin, bash up the fruits and put 40% um, alcohol on them and then strain off after about four to six weeks. And what's that for? That's for celebrating. Oh, no, 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 sorry. It's good for the circulation. That's right. Over to you, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you so much, Anne. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and I'm sure with 21 people hanging out that there must be lots of questions. So um, because we've, um, we've got Anne on, on, on the main screen, I can't see you all. So if you have a question for Anne, please, could you type it in the chat? Um, and then I'll invite you to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Um, otherwise, I think it's going to be a bit of a scrum. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I, I would very much like some um, Hawthorne brandy right now. That sounds absolutely mm, delicious. Good stuff. I, uh, I make a rose hip and um, elderberry syrup every year to get me through the winter. Very nice. I used to do a lot of um, talks to women's institutes and garden clubs, and I would take along my anti-flatulence liqueur <laughs> with um, seeds of things like caraway and coriander. Um, so mostly aromatic spices brewed up in, a, in spirits. I'm, I'm very much in favor of spirits. I think it's a very traditional thing. Um, and we used to get the teaspoons out when everybody had a cup of tea and taste the, um, it was a digestive essentially. Um, we don't in the UK have a good record with um, liqueurs and bitters. But if anybody goes to the continent, then um, always try and get the local bitters and bring them back with you. Mm, good tip. Uh, so the questions are starting to roll in. So Steve Marcus, do you want to go first? Yes. Yep. Thank you, Anne, for a very informative talk. Uh, really enjoyed it. Curious as to how you prepared your growing beds on that land. I'm in the far north of Scotland, surrounded by such forest and uh, our patch was once uh, exactly that. Okay so um, we were advised that we might need to add calcium to the soil but when I actually tested the soil I found it, it wasn't a lack of it was about pH of six um, under the conifers. What it lacked was um, fibre and um, humus 
So it was very poor in that way. And by lots of mulching with all sorts of materials from cardboard to straw to grass clippings and so on, we found the soil um, improved considerably and that we were able to grow um, a lot of things. Um, the advantage of acid soil is that you can grow lots of things like witch hazel um, and so on. But um, uh, I suppose that would be the way forward, I think, would be mulching beds and checking the pH. If it gets much below six, then it, it does restrict you a little bit more. But you can grow things like bilberries, which we couldn't keep going in our site. It was not acid enough. Fantastic. And um, Avon. I'm unmuted. I was just curious, the equipment that you use to make the extractions or the distillations, what, what do you use to make these products once you've got the natural ingredient? Yeah. Um, I think it depends on scale. So uh, a lot can be done with kitchen equipment, but um, we th there's more about this in the book, by the way, but um, we did invest in a heavy duty grinder for grinding up the bark, which had to be imported from, it was a Chinese um, herb powder grinder, uh, had to be more imported from America and um, um, buying a labeler to label things that we were going to be selling. So it, it, it depends a bit on the, on the scale. You can get small scale distillers just for your own use. Again, um, you need to think about going further up market uh, for equipment if you want produce that can be marketed. Okay, and next we've got Darren. I am. I have a great talk. I was just going, just wondering, how do you sort of standardise doses of particularly things like willow, um, which could really vary depending on the growing conditions? Mm. Yeah, I think it's a brilliant question because I really wanted to carry out research into how the seasons, the harvesting, the growing conditions, all of those things um, affected um, the active ingredients and because of my training I, I knew a lot about the active ingredients and there is quite a lot of variability so even just in all the uh, willow family uh, members I think the great thing about herbal medicine is that because it's been centuries of traditional use very often the dosage um, for, on a traditional basis using teas is is very safe um, but it could be a bit underpowered and so medical herbalists nowadays tend to use more uh, tinctures, which keep well without using a fridge and also, which is why I'm interested in spirits um, and also uh, powders and, and other extracts. So, so I, I think there's a lot more research that needs to be done. Sadly, um, there's no profit in finding out some of these things. And so um, funding for research is, is extremely limited. But I am keen on talking to other growers about ways that we can uh, maybe team up with um, perhaps the university laboratory departments who might offer low cost analysis so that we could start to share experience. And that, that would be um, a wonderful step forward if we could at least make some inroads. That's great, thanks. Okay, who do we have next? Um, so Heather. Can't hear you. Can't hear you. <laughs> well, you muted, Heather. Thank you? you very much. Yes, yeah, sorry. That was a really interesting talk. I love all things herbal. Um, <laughs> I did actually do a little workshop a couple of weeks ago about um, nutrition in weeds. And I came away from that realising that actually a lot of the vegetables that are grown nowadays are devitalised. Um, because of the genetics, the, the way we've, we've modified um, our plants. And I started thinking, right, well, if they're so denaturalized, de I'm going to start just picking nettles, dogs, um, maybe plantain. And 
mixing it with herbs. I've been using parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme and Swiss chard and just blitzing it and making a soup out of it. Um, and I, I've been using that soup for about four days now. And I do have, I've got several autoimmune problems, but eczema is one of them. And it, I've, it's definitely taken the redness out of the skin. But I'm just wondering, can, can, it, be, can it be better? The other thing I did was um, rose hip syrup, which is delicious, and hawthorn, hawthorn ketchup that he made. I can't actually drink spirits. I can't, it affects my system. So I, I just can't take alcohol. So it's a really good way for me to take in um, the hawthorn. It's, it's very arduous to make, but it's actually delicious. It's really, really nice. Um, so I'm, I'm just wanting to go out there and harvest. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting about what you say is that, of course, many of the active ingredients in plants were, are there to prevent um, pests and insects eating them. So when plants are grown in cultivated kind of um, gentler conditions, then you might well expect that the, the level of the active ingredients would be less, which, which would be the same for vegetables as well. So, so that there is a rationale for why that happens. Um, it's quite possible that the, the nettle and the plantain are helping, uh, they do have anti-inflammatory effects, but they might also be doing, the, the thing about herbs, which is great, is that they are multi-purpose, which is very permaculture because for example, nettles also include increased diuresis. So they, they include the speed at which things move out of the, through the kidneys in, into the urine so that there are less uh, toxins um, perhaps irritating the blood. So it might not just be that anti-inflammatory effect, sort of antihistamine effect, but it might be other ways that, that the plants are working. Um, there is so much to learn about these these plants it, it is quite fantastic and there are one year online courses that are run by the national institute of medical herbalist and also uh, botanica and also new vitality these are three organizations online that just for starters i think there are right. more um, that you might want to look at to, to find yes. out more about i think I'm the right. underlying rationale for some of these things mm. The other thing I've been looking at, there's a, a lovely gentleman in Hale, just outside St. Ives. He, he's gardened, he's, he's made um, Simon. a forest yeah. garden. No, it's, um, oh, what's his name? Raymond. Oh, Raymond. No okay. He's about 83 years old, highly knowledgeable, ex airline pilot, talks and talks and talks and talks, but so knowledgeable. And he's grown um, things like autumn olives and sea buckthorns on sand, on sand dunes. He's actually yeah. got so much, he's got so much knowledge. Um, he's a lovely, lovely man. So I'm actually trying to in include that on my land. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work on clay, but we'll see. <laughs> the, yes. Yeah. Herbs, herbs and berries. I just think they have so much to offer. Great. I can see some more questions. Okay, so we've got um, we've got another one from Darren. If you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, I was just thinking. Um, have you tried producing any of your own oils for this sort of use, or even your own spirits? And are there particular ones that work better for the medicinal uses? So, are you talking about carrier oils like nut and seed oils, or are yeah. you talking about? Yeah. Um, yeah, one of the things I wanted to do more of was um, hazelnut oil, because uh, it seemed to me that hazelnuts should be available if you can get them before the squirrels. And um, there are there are small scale machines that you can use, like a little, um, almost like a little liquidizer with a candle um, to to warm the nuts and extract the oil. And um, and of course we can grow lots of sunflower seeds. So we ought to be able to do that, but but it is quite a cumbersome process, and I don't think I would have ever achieved the the object of, of a viable option. Um, but I think we should be producing them in in this country definitely. Um, and in terms of uh, the spirits, the distillation apparatus, which um, is, is, is detailed in the book, but the distillation apparatus 
um, that I used for distilling witch hazel would also distill um, alcohol. But there are rules and regulations about the production of um, alcohol at home using distillation. Um, so um, instead, it, it is possible to get exemption from um, tax if you're using um, alcohol for medicinal purposes, as long as you're not um, so as long as you're not doing herbs which are more cosmetic or or um, other uses. So so there are ways forward, not necessarily your own production, but accessing those kinds of resources. Yeah. And do you think that particular oils or spirits work better than others in the medicinal uses? Um, well, there is <laughs> there is a problem with organically grown oils because they deteriorate quite fast. They don't have preservatives and, and the like added to them. So it's a bit horses for courses, really. It depends what your purpose is. And similarly, with spirits, uh, you, if you can go on holiday and buy very cheap spirits and bring them back, I'm not sure if you can still do that, actually, then um, uh, in many ways, they will do just as good, good a job extracting um, the active ingredients of herbs. So I, I, I take a rather um, sort of generous view that it depends a bit on how much you can afford and, and what's available um, rather than having any kind of super fine version of um, the, these carriers or extracting um, liquids. Okay. Great, thanks Anne. Um, thanks Darren. Um, so Anne Thompson's got a question. Do you want to unmute yourself? Um, hi Anne, thanks for an interesting talk. Um, can you tell me, is there any plants that, med medicinal plants that do well in a polytunnel? That... Where, whereabouts? Well, uh, we're in northeast Scotland, but um, okay. I'm just wondering if some of them, you know, which are more tropical, uh, that that might do better in shelter. Um, there's, there's, wow. <laughs> well, there's lots of possibilities. At Pointsfield Herbs in Scotland is a herb nursery which have they have poly, uh, uh, polytunnels and so they might be good um, uh, to, to talk to. But um, for example, chaseberry, Vitex agonis castus, which is a, a Mediterranean plant, which is very useful in, in menopause and um, problem periods, is um, more likely to, to survive in a polytunnel. Um, I've got lemon eucalyptus in a glass house here. So um, there are lots and lots of Mediterranean and slightly sort of mountain tropical, um, the eucalyptus particularly, and, and the more aromatic herbs. If you've got a polytunnel, fantastic. You can, you can do some of those. Can, uh, can you just, can you just re repeat what that first one was, the berry? Oh, Vitex agnus castus, the chaste berry. Chaste berry, okay. Chaste berry, monk's pepper. It has, um, uh, the effect is, like progesterone it isn't progesterone but it's similar to in the body okay thank you it used to be used as an anaphrodisiac to put people off sex <laughs> <laughs> i've noticed that steve marcus has just put um a link into pontisfield herb nursery i've just put in a 200 quid order with them so my my herbs are hopefully arriving next week it's a um, wonderful place yeah i mean they're right visit. Scotland and they, they produce their own seeds and cultivate yeah. their own plants so they'll be of hardy they'll be of hardy stock yes um also I know Martin Crawford has um Agnes Castus at the Agroforestry Research Trust in in Devon thank you are there any more questions you've got We've got, uh, we've got 20 minutes left until the end. So if anybody's got any more questions, that's fine. If not, um, then we'll just go into a bit of a general share about everyone's projects. Um, oh, Aben's asking if you can put the spelling of the last herb in the chat. I can. Um, just to say, it's another one of the ones in the book, by the way. <laughs> Do you want to put the um, the link to the um, to your website in the chat as well? So, and it's also I put a link in the first email that I sent out. If you all received that, um, there should be an, uh, a link to um, Anne's project and also to the book. Just to say, on the website there is a newsletter sign up. I, I try to do a little round 
summary of what I've been doing every two to three months. And so you're, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in to the book on the website and then you can explore the, the website itself. Wonderful. Okay, well, um, if there are no more questions, I'm going to stop the recording um, and then we'll just do a quick go round. So if there's, there's 17 of us left and we've got about 20 minutes. So um, if you want to just tell us a little bit about what you've been doing with your projects, then we've all got about a minute each. Um, so same format as before. If um, Bye to everybody that's leaving now. Thank you for coming. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you could, if you could then pass on to somebody else um, when you finish talking. So stop the.